Hello everyone, it's Tuesday night, winning, and um, it's keys to winning a biblical life. I hope you've had a good week. Um, those of you who live in Cape Town, I was very excited to see the sun shining today after what felt like months and months and months of rain. Very grateful for the rain, very grateful that our dams are overflowing, but really nice to see the sun again. And in fact, on the way home, there were so many people, all the Get Fit guys, running, cycling, skateboarding. It's like everything comes alive when the sun comes out. So glad you're joining me. If you don't know who I am, if this is your first time, my name is Debbie and I am lead pastor of an amazing church, A City Church, which is celebrating their fifth name change birthday this Sunday. So we have a really great service lined up. So if you can't get to us in person, then please join us online. Saturday we have Radiant, our event, followed by the book launch, my first book, Finding Me. And if you want to know more about the book, you can jump onto debbiesloan.com, my website, Hey Nikki, um, where you can sign up to join the weekly devotionals, um, where you can purchase your copy or copies of the book. So, and then Saturday with the book launch, which you can also catch online if you can't come in person because we are fully booked. Um, and I'll just be doing a couple of things around my book, signing books, and it's going to be a really, really great weekend. Isn't it lovely to have so many things to celebrate? And the fact that A City Church is an authentic, life-giving church. Sorry, I'm pushing and pumping my church, but I can because I love it. Where no one is perfect, but anything is possible. And so please join us if you can. would love to have you there online. So if you've missed any of the winning episodes, you can pick them up on Facebook. Last week we had a really great part two on overcoming life's problems and we looked at depression. Loved one of the comments um, from the, one of the guests last week who said they felt like they'd been to a brain gym. That's always good to have your brain exercised on a Tuesday night. So tonight we're looking at, again, overcoming problems. And let's be honest, we always face, hey Zama, life is, there's always challenges, that's life. You know, I think sometimes people will often say, you know, hey there, good to have you with me. Um, you know, God's obviously punishing me or I've done something wrong or no, problems are a natural part of life and we need to learn how to manage, overcome and win because problems are going to be there until the end of time. So this is, hey, King and Queen, this has been a really great couple of weeks. Hey, Azola, uh, a great Benita, a great couple of weeks just looking at putting keys in your hand to be able to actually face problems. Hey, Linda, good to see you. Linda bought her copy of the book today. Candice, good to have you online. Candice is part of the Radiant team. She's been doing a lot of work behind the scenes with Zama, who leads that team. So really looking forward to it. So remember, guys, comment, like, share. It's good to share. You know, it's no use you getting input and you're growing and then you keep it to yourself. You need to share because that's also part of serving, isn't it? I mean, it's the process of multiplication and you get to be a part of that. I heard a statement recently where it was said of believers, we're given a mandate by God and we need to spread the gospel. We need to tell people about Jesus. And it's a mandate from God where we don't ask questions first. We just say, yes, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do and then ask questions later. I love that. That's such a powerful statement. So tonight is just one way of getting the gospel out there and using Live Online. And I can't believe I get to do this with you joining me as my guests. So are you ready for tonight? Are we going to get going, get cracking? Um, so tonight we're looking at, and I'm deliberately not calling it a problem, um, because sometimes there's a negative connotation with problem. Tonight we're going to be looking at singleness, and singleness is not a problem. 
Um, you know, in my years of counseling and being in full-time ministry, I've always tried to steer clear of putting that connotation on single people like there's, there's, they're sort of the misfits. There's something wrong with them. Um, I just feel that that's a wrong label. And singleness, although it may not always be perceived as a gift, I think it is a gift. I think it is a season um, in people's lives. For some people, the season lasts a very long time. But it isn't a problem. It's, it's something that is faced and it needs to be embraced rather than kicked against. I always remember as um, a, a young adult, I kind of got married last in the group of friends that I went to varsity with. And, you know, I sort of got to the point where I was everyone's bridesmaid and never the bride. I mean, I had a whole collection of bridesmaids outfits. In fact, I was the bridesmaids queen. I knew exactly what to do, how to host bridal showers. I was the expert. And, um, you know, people in meaning well would always ask those questions where you just have to smile, grit your teeth and keep moving. You know, like, you know, your biological clock is ticking. Um, don't worry, it'll be your turn soon. You know, meaning well, but oh so condescending. And um, so I have a real special heart for guys who aren't married for whatever reason, whether they have not married before, whether they are divorced, whether they are single through a, a, a death, it doesn't matter. Singleness is not a problem. Singleness is a season. So tonight we're going to be addressing it from that premise. That's why I'm not calling singleness a problem. Um, I think today it's very different to say 10, maybe 20 years ago. A lot of guys would particularly girls, would get married from home. So they'd live with their parents, leave their parents home to get married. But it's different today. Guys are leaving home earlier. They're pursuing careers. Often universities are not in their hometown. So there's living away from home from university days. Um, and so I just want to share a couple of kind of um, uh, background stories for different scenarios and don't switch off if you're not single lean in because definitely you know someone who is so this is a very practical helpful session tonight that is applicable to everyone at some point has been or will be single for whatever reason so lean in and listen carefully. This particular statement comes from someone, a female who's 28. Please, none of the examples I'm using tonight are any of my clients. Um, these are stories that I've picked up from different sources. I don't disclose client stories um, on any platform because of confidentiality reasons. So if you are a client of mine, please don't think, eek, is my story going to come out on live online on a Tuesday night? No, it isn't. Hey, good to see you, Delia. So this first one is a 28-year-old female. Most of my friends are married. I'm not always included in everything. I'm on my own quite a bit, except when I'm at church or at work. I do get lonely and I just want to be able to call someone my own. Second female is 38. I don't mind being single. I enjoy my job. I'm very involved at my church. I would like to marry and have children. And in my past, there were opportunities for me to marry, but none of the guys seemed right. I've committed my life to God and his plans for my future. My main problem is just the opinions and comments of others, some of which I mentioned earlier. There's so much pressure to get married that it makes me feel like there's something wrong with me. The third one is a male in his 30s and he says marriage is such a huge step. I'm afraid that I'm going to make a mistake. What if I can't provide for my family like I need to? I'm not sure that I'm ready to commit my whole life to just one person. And the fourth and last example is also a male in his 40s and he said 
I've decided to care for my mom who has a terminal illness. I'd love to marry, but I don't want to burden a wife with the medical expenses and the huge responsibilities that I need to devote in caring for my mom. So there's a bit of different, different backgrounds in terms of people's status relationally and just some of their opinions. And I think there's a little bit of everything that maybe all of us can identify with. And maybe you know people who have similar backgrounds. I think often in life, it's not so much what we're going through. You know, that's difficult in itself, but it's the comments and opinions of others because everyone has an opinion. And I think it's important that we learn to navigate the season we're in so we don't wish seasons of our lives away. Like so often um, when I've counseled, um, people would, I wish I was in a relationship or I wish I was married. We can't wish away big chunks of our lives. You know, God's come, John 10, 10, that we may have life and have it in abundance regardless of the space we find ourselves in. So I'm hoping that tonight's input will encourage us with the following. Embrace your space and don't kick against it because kicking against it works in opposition. There's often conflict, frustration, irritation, aggravation. Whereas embracing it, there's an opportunity to grow and to learn instead of the season being a death time in our lives. So here's a case in terms of someone who was married and who got divorced, married for a long time, had two children, husband filed for divorce. And the person, the woman felt extremely ashamed. She felt like a big failure, um, very conscious of, will people criticize me? What's wrong with me? Having to make huge lifestyle changes, moving to a smaller home, um, having to downscale and downsize, just not coping, feeling overwhelmed at the thought of being single and having to raise two young children. Then another example, someone, a female again in her 60s who, whose husband passed away and she says, I've cared for my husband for so many years and my life feels so empty. I don't have anything of importance to do. My partner was my whole life and I feel like I've lost my identity. The children are married and no one needs me anymore. So each one of these cases, there's a very specific perspective. Is there something wrong with me? Battling with people's opinions, shame. Am I going to cope? Um, I don't want to burden people with my issues. I'd rather stay on my own. And I think so often the perspectives may not be balanced and healthy ones. And remember, a perspective which is a thought will dominate and shape your thinking, your speech, and your functioning. So what you feed with regards to perspective grows. What you focus on, you feed, it grows. What you ignore, you starve, and it dies. And I think tonight it's looking at make sure that you have a healthy perspective regarding not just your relational status, but any situation that you're facing. Um, I think with a lot of these people, it was definitely their opinion and issue was, there's something wrong with me, or there's something wrong with my status. Um, so I think the first thing that I want to look at is, there's two statements I'm going to make. The first is, God says, this is your status, I'm enough regardless of your relational status. And regardless of your relational status, you have a significant part and role to play in life, regardless of your status. So single life, biblically, is an approved alternative to being married. It's not stigmatized in a negative way by the Lord. It's a part of life. Single life in the, this context, that is a preferred, sorry, is an alternative way to marriage. I need to just add a disclaimer that it's single celibate life is an alternative to marriage. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament suggested, remember this is the Apostle Paul's opinion, he suggested that single people would be better off remaining single 
because in his opinion, they would be free from the worries and distractions of people who are married. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 7, 23 to 32, he says, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is, hashtag single. Are you pledged to a woman? Do you seek to be released? Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in life. And I want to spare you this. Paul was not married himself. His opinion was that if you remained single, you would be able to focus a lot more of your time, resource and attention on serving God. Remember, that's his opinion. It doesn't mean that if you're married, you can't serve God and you've made a mistake. Marriage is an institution that has been designed by God. It's not a secular institution. Marriage was designed by God for many reasons, one of which is it is a symbol of Christ's relationship with the church, the church being the bride, Jesus being the bridegroom. Marriage was created because the woman is a helpmate to the man. They're a team. So marriage brings a team together and two are better than one. Marriage was also for pleasure. Marriage was also for procreation. Marriage was to bring about a sense of companionship, relationship, doing life together. Remember, God is very relational and he created male and female to be in a marriage, in a relationship. So please note that Paul had a very strong opinion about marriage. He was not anti-women and anti-marriage. Rather, he was pro being totally devoted to serving to God and having no distractions. He says in that same scripture, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs and he can please the Lord. However, you can be married and also serve the Lord successfully. So I know people in the mission field who've made a decision to remain celibate and to remain single. And for them, they felt that if they married, they wouldn't be able to fulfill their destiny. Some people have the gift and ability to be single and celibate. Remember, it's not single and not celibate. It's single and celibate. And that's a very specific calling. Um, I know some people who it takes them a long time to get married. They do worry has God given me the celibacy calling? You'll know if you have that calling because there'll be no desire to marry. So be very conscious of that. Um, the single life is obviously an opportunity to serve God differently than when you're in a relationship, but no more or less significant. So when we look at marriage, and I am very pro-marriage, that's why I'm a marriage officer, and work with couples in pre-marriage counseling um, is that although marriage is incredibly significant and powerful and I've seen in married couples who when they've come together and serve God as a team it takes their impact and influence for the kingdom to a new level um, but I want to speak to people tonight maybe your desire is regarding your relationship status is not where you're at at the moment. Maybe you want to be in a relationship, but for different reasons, it's not there. I understand that it's tough and that it's challenging. But I also understand that there are two ways to journey through tough times, either with God and following his plan and embracing that, or kicking against it and just becoming incredibly frustrated. Um, I think it's learning to rise above things like disappointment for the season that you're in. And instead of asking all the wrong questions, which generally evolve around, why is this happening to me? What is wrong with me? 
Why is no one interested in me? Why do I attract the wrong kind of person? Will there ever be anyone out there for me? Those are very natural and valid questions, but they're generally not going to be answered accurately. Change your question and change the person you're asking the question. For example, rather ask God, what do you want me to learn from this situation? How can I serve you in this season? Show me what I need to see. Help me to develop myself in this season while I have the time to do it. Instead of kicking against it and just wishing it away and I can't wait for when it's all over. You know, I think it's also learning to rise above people's opinions and society's stereotyping. You know, society is very, you get married at a certain age, you have your first baby at a certain age, you have your second baby, and this is how it all works in the land of idealism. We don't live in an idealistic society. We live in a real world. Stuff doesn't happen like it does in fairy tales. It happens like it does in life. And so what if you get married at 63? Does it matter who's counting? It's run your own race and run in your own lane, but keep your focus on God. People's opinions are often based on their own belief system. We need to wrap ourselves around what does God say about us and our status and where we're at. You know, it's, it's singleness. I remember um, in a previous church, the minister saying to me, wow, I better, I better get you to impact lots of people's lives because when you get married and you have children I'm not going to be able to use you in the same way now I mean I got what he was saying and in that season of being single I did I devoted myself to doing lots of things but when I got married I devoted myself to serving God in a different way no less effective I think a challenge that single people face is often should I marry or not some people who are single have not chosen their relationship status. It's happened through a series of events, other people's decisions. For example, the divorcee who didn't choose to get divorced. The person who is approaching 40 and never wanted to be single, but has just genuinely never found their soulmate. So what's God's take on, on this? Well, John 16 verse 33, listen to this scripture. I've told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you will have many tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. But be of good cheer, which means take heart, take courage, for I have overcome the world. And that statement, overcome the world, means that God has deprived the world of the power to harm you and he's conquered it for you. So if you're in a, a state relationally that is not where you want to be, God knew that you would face that challenge and he's won it for you, but he's won it to the degree where it won't deprive you of growth. It won't deprive you of who you are as an individual. Society will often say being single means you're living deprived. Rubbish. That scripture there says he has overcome the world. He has deprived the world of the power to harm you and he's conquered it for you. So when you see yourself as the Lord sees you, I'm enough. This is a season. I'm feeling what I'm feeling and that's very normal, but I'm not going to live in these feelings. I'm going to change my line of questioning. I'm going to embrace this space because ultimately God knows the plans and the purposes he has for your life. So your destiny is not floating around in the cosmos, just kind of whatever it's going to land or wherever it's going to land. No, it's specifically planned. And remember, God's not vindictive. God is good and all he does is good. He doesn't measure out punishment. Um, I'm going to keep you single because you messed up in, um, you know, in, in 1997. That's not how God works. He, he said in John 10.10, 10, he's come that you may have life and have thoughts of it. Here's another scripture um, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has come upon you except that which is common to humanity. 
But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you be, may be able to bear it. How often in, in being single and not embracing that space, you compromise. You maybe compromise in a dead end relationship that you know that this, this person is just not for me. But I cannot overcome and resist the fear of loneliness or I can't remain celibate. God's given you the ability to overcome that. He's given you a way out. And remember in Ecclesiastes, in his time, he makes all things beautiful. Anything premature, it doesn't work. If you take something that's baking in the oven out too early, it's raw, you get tummy ache. Anything prem doesn't work. Let God be God in your relationship status and stop trying to do his job for him. He knows what he's doing. Trust me, he made the universe. I think he can work through your relationship status. I love this one, Romans 8, 28, one of my faves. And all things work together for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his, pur his purposes. The living translation, listen to this. And we know that all things happen to us, all things that happen to us, is working for our good. If we love God and are fitting into his plans. Love that last phrase, fitting into his plans, not him fitting into our plans and our time frame. Lord, you know that I wanted to be married by X age. It's not happening, so I'm going to take matters into my own hands. Let God be God. Every trial we face is an opportunity to draw closer to God. So the process is identify the issue. So maybe you're in a position of being single. Maybe it's not the fact that you're single that's the issue. Maybe there's an underlying issue. Maybe it's fear of loneliness. Maybe it's fear of who's going to look after me when I get old and am I going to end up on the pavement. So maybe it's fear you need to deal with and not your relationship status. So stop, face what you feel around your status and start asking the Lord the right questions. What do I need to learn from this? What do I need to see? Give me eyes to see and ears to hear. I think with whatever we're facing is keep your inner narrative in check. What are you saying to yourself about yourself? What are you saying to yourself about your situation? And what are you saying to yourself about God? Is it biblical? So if you're speaking words of fatalism, this is my lot in life, this is how it's always going to be, I'm always just going to be this weird, unmarried, plant person with a thousand cats, where's the scripture that substantiates that statement? Well, you're not going to find it because it's not there. So make sure that your inner narrative is built on what the word of God says about you and about your status and about your future. Remember Everything passes, nothing is forever except eternity. God's, God is with you all the time. His love for you is unconditional. Um, he's constantly working on your situation. The Bible teaches us that Jesus is our intercessor, constantly interceding to God on our behalf. You know, a tough way to fight any battle is when you're fighting what is external and internal. So if you're dealing with a battle against yourself and you're trying to deal with external things, well, how are you going to win that? Get this right. Because when this is right, your speech, your actions, your lifestyle wins because it's built on what the Lord teaches. You know, there's so much pressure, as I said earlier, to, to marry. And I, I think so often it's looking at but Lord, I, I choose to stand on your promise. I choose to stand on your timeline for my life. Um, so often when people are looking at their relationship status and not liking it, but it's a great opportunity to change how you see it and do things like resource yourself. You know, you've got money and time to study, so study Get the counsel of the wise. Wait rather than rush. And, and in terms of making any relationship decision, it's wait for that peace. You know, I remember 
it wasn't someone I was counselling so I can share it. She'd been um, single for so long. She was divorced. She'd raised her kids from when they were little on her own. And she got to in her 60s and it's like, I'm tired of being tired of being tired of being unmarried. So she rushed into a marriage that was so destructive um, and it ended in divorce. Don't make hasty decisions. Don't feel pressurized. I have to act now. This is it. It's never, it's never this is it with God. God moves strategically. God moves in a way that brings peace. God always gives options. God will never put anyone in a corner and this is your last opportunity. God always gives options. The enemy will accuse and threaten with. If you don't take this, there'll be no other opportunity. This is do or die. And that's not how it works. Um, I love this story of a 64-year-old who was serving in the mission field her whole life. She'd remained celibate. She had, she felt she had the calling of celibacy. And it got to when she turned 64 and she'd retired and she said to the Lord, I'd love to have someone to call my own. And she met and married a retired um, missionary who was a widow. And I love her statement. She says, I've been surprised by joy. What did she do her whole life? She just put God first. And all these things were added, Matthew 6, 33. So as we close tonight, look within yourself when it comes to facing, maybe your particular challenge is single. Look within yourself and face your shadows. Your shadow is what follows you and maybe you have a fear, fear of being alone, fear of financial instability, fear of loneliness, fear of being labeled, fear of not having children. Face your shadow, expose it. Recognize your position in Christ. Take advantage of the time that you have. Get involved in helping others. Instead of being inward focused, be outward focused. You have value to add to the lives of others. Wake up in the morning with, Lord, give me one person I can help today and give me one thing I can do exceptionally well. Increase your time in the word, in prayer and in worship. And I love Romans 12 that speaks about be devoted to one another honor one another, share with those in need. So those of you who aren't single, stop treating singles like there's something wrong with them. Don't lump them all together in a singles only, small group, life group, connect group. Don't do that. They don't want to be with other singles. Invite them to your stuff. Bring them into your family. Stop labeling them. Stop trying to fix them. They're not broken. And stop trying to fix them up with someone. They're able to make their own decisions. So I hope you've gotten, remember, each time you take one thing out that you feel you can apply to your life. In tonight's session, maybe take one thing out you can give to someone else. I've loved being with you tonight. Don't forget, comment, like, share. Jump onto my website, debbiesloan.com, get your copy of Finding Me and get a copy to bless someone with. Love being with you. God bless all of you and see you next time. Bye.